Nothing is better. 
I walked away. The road was dark, I could not see. My hope was
Father, thank you so much that you're an incredible God, worthy of all our praise. You're holy, and we love you. Mm-hmm. Amen. So I was, uh, thank you, worship team, by the way. Uh, incredible. So I was praying, Lord, what can I pray for Eddie about? Lead me. And then it came to me, well, ask him. And then I was like, well, okay, I'll pray. And then it came to me, maybe it's a nudge, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll have Cindy Early come up and pray. So make your way up. Um, uh, but how, how can we pray for you today? Um, one of the things that my voice would hold. True. Um, dealing a little bit with that. Um, but man, I think, you know, Lib actually asked me this week, how are you feeling? You know, a couple weeks in to, to lead pastor role, and I said, really good. Um, so I feel your prayers, because I know you're praying for us as a family in that as well. You got that, Cindy? I thought I was looking for you, and I couldn't find you. Did you run out? <laughs> no, I was supposed to pray. Yeah, so um, let's, let's uh, pray for the children as well as we dismiss them, but uh, after prayer, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your presence through the worship time. Thank you for the worship team leading and just bringing us to a place of focusing in on you. Mm-hmm. I thank you, Father God, for Eddie and for his love for this church, for his love for this people. Lord, for each individual of this congregation who feels that same way, God, be praised and thank you for this group of people. I pray that you would just bless Eddie in his bringing the word to us today. Will you just open up to us, open our eyes, our hearts, our ears, and Lord, may Eddie just be a vessel that shares what it is you've laid on his heart for us today. Be honored, Father God. Be honored and be glorified. And Lord, change us. May we leave here today a different person than from when we came. We love you, Lord. And we're so grateful you hear our prayers. So grateful that you love us. So grateful. Thank you. And to Jesus, most precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, I was blessed by that. I think Cindy probably was as well. And thank you, Elvin, for modeling just the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. We want to be a people where that is true of us. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to try to cover the whole chapter this morning, and I'm just going to be honest. We could probably do 10 sermons in this chapter alone. And so we have our work cut out for us. Next week, uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament. We are going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to start a series in Genesis called Origins. And we're going to look at the origins of creation, the origins of man's relationship with God, the origins of work and sin, and we'll look at the origins of really the Abrahamic covenant as well. And I'm extremely excited about that study. I hope you guys are as well. You know, last week, New Year's Day, we finished up Philippians chapter 3, where Paul used this illustration of an athlete who's straining toward the goal, who's pressing on to the finish line. And he used that illustration for us as Christians, as followers of Christ, to really, for our goal of growing in Christ-likeness. That we would have this singular focus of being with Jesus, becoming like him, and doing what he did. And then he ends with the reminder, this glorious truth, that Jesus will finish what he started in us. Right? He says, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It's this great reminder that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And then he says this in verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, therefore, because of that, my beloved brothers, 
whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Do you, do you sense Paul's love for the church in Philippi, for the people, the Philippians who make up this church? He says this, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul revealed our life purpose and our goal last week. We saw that. He implored us to focus on it, to press on towards it. But now he tells us to stand firm in it. He knows that there will be instability. Things will happen that will try to take us and shake us, that will attempt to take our eyes off of the mission, off of our goal, off of God. He says, stand firm, be rooted, because there will be storms. Earthquakes that will attempt to take your life off of the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. As Liv and I were talking about, you know, coming up with a sermon slide and what's a visual? What's a visual for this? She came up with the idea of a tree. And instantly I went to Psalm 1. I love this psalm. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. This is a remarkable psalm. He's saying there's a man whose life is deeply rooted and firmly planted, who sucks up the pure water of life, a man who is productive, a man whose life is sustained in its flourishing capability, and a man who does things that really count and prosper. And then there's another man who's like chaff, just blowing around without purpose, without value, just shapeless, rootless, unstable, good for nothing. Now, which would you rather be? The first one is the one who walks with God. The second one is the wicked man who rejects God. And if you notice, the, the key to the man who walks with God is in verse 2. It says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. See, there's two things that contribute to a stable life, to standing firm. That's delighting in the Lord. That's having a living relationship with him. And then meditating on his words so that the life, that your life is viewed through divine perspective. It's that, that lens that we talked about last Sunday, having the godly lens. On the other hand, you have the shifting, blowing, useless chaff of the world headed for judgment. I'd rather be that productive, stable life that is offered to every Christian that is God's desire and salvation, not just that you would be with him in heaven one day, but that you would live a vibrant and full of life-giving relationship with God, a life that's rooted, stable, and productive. It's really a marvelous description of the godly, of what God wants you to be, spiritually stable and standing firm. So now back to Philippians 4, Paul is going to follow up with this. He's going to say, stand firm. And then he's going to give us seven distinctives, seven directives or seven points for how we can actually stand firm thus in the Lord. And the first is this, be agreeable. He says, I entreat Udia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. You see it there. Be agreeable. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Paul is going to bring up a known conflict in the church. We know that they had conflict in the Philippian church. Remember back in chapter 2 when he's talking about do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but consider others more important than yourself. Now he's actually taking that and he's giving it to the, the specific direction. Now imagine this, right? You're sitting in the Philippian church, and he's reading this to the church, and I'm sure that both of these ladies are in the audience, and Paul calls them out. Now put yourself in their shoes. How many of you instantly are like, 
How dare you, Paul? But, but you have to understand, this is, this is being agreeable. Unity in the church is a serious thing. It's an incredibly serious matter. Both of these women we know are believers. They labored with Paul in planting the church. He, he knows that they're saved. He says uh, to all of you who, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we're not dealing with unbelievers. These are believers in the church. And he's calling them to be agreeable. He's urging them to settle whatever dispute they are having. Paul also commissions the church to help. Well, how do they do this? Well, number one, don't feed into the conflict. Don't start taking sides. Don't start, you know, talking behind people's backs. Don't feed into the quarreling. Instead, he reminds them of their commonality. We should be able to agree about the essentials of doctrine and the core message of Christianity. We should be able to unite in the Lord. This is what Paul is calling them to. Hey, don't focus so much on what you don't have in common. Actually, zero in on what you have in common. See, there's a difference between the open-handed, the secondary issues, or the tertiary issues, and the, the prime issues, the, the, the things that really matter, the doctrines that really, really matter. It's okay if we don't agree on everything. But we cannot allow those secondary issues to divide us. And I'm telling you that way more, 99, I'm making that percentage up, like all preachers probably do. The majority of conflict in the church is not on the primary issues. It's on opinion. It's on methods. And we see churches over and over and over again who divide on things that Paul's like, listen, be agreeable. You need to be agreeable with each other. Be serious about unity. It's okay to disagree on these secondary issues, but we're quick to reject and be contentious if things don't go our way or if our opinions are not heeded. We need to be serious about the call to be peacemakers, cultivating harmony, not division in the church, supporting one another, sustaining one another, the reason why this is so serious is because when there is conflict in a church, it will generate instability throughout the whole church. When there is unity and oneness and peace and harmony as a whole, the people in the church get to enjoy that stability. Major conflicts can cause all kinds of sins, partiality, critical spirits, negative attitudes, Bitterness, revenge, hostility, pride. When believers experience conflict with each other, it is God's will that we quickly and humbly reconcile our differences. Why? For the sake of the image of Christ. We are a reflection to the world about who Christ is. It is to mirror the message of the gospel which is full of mercy and grace and forgiveness. Can you imagine the extent of damage that could have happened if social media was around back then? Or like all of a sudden, Syntyche and Yodia, they're, they're, they're like on you know, Instagram and they're, you know, how, how could this happen? Or can you believe what Syntyche did? And, and all of a sudden it gets aired out to everybody who's on social media. Paul's admonishment to these two women at Philippi rings truer today than ever before. When Christians choose to take up the cause to be right, instead of taking up the cause, the cross, the image the world sees of Jesus through us becomes marred, and the church suffers degradation. In order to stand firm, we must be agreeable. Here's the second point then. If we look at verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So the second point is be joyful. First, be agreeable. If you want to stand firm, you also need to be joyful. Paul really wants to emphasize this. He, he says it over again, right? He's like, rejoice. And again, I say this. this. This is hugely important. Joy is a tremendous force in being able to stand firm. Why? 
because we tend to be victimized by our circumstances. We have our highs, we have our lows, and that's the way our week goes. We're just fluctuating up and down. And, you know, if I'm successful at my job, if my relationships are what they ought to be, if there's calm in my life and everything is going the way I'd like it to go, hey, everything is peaceful, I'm joyful, it's all good. But as soon as that starts to disintegrate, all of a sudden, no longer do I have joy. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying we, should re- we shouldn't rejoice in ourselves. We shouldn't rejoice in our circumstances. We shouldn't rejoice in our relationships. What does he say? Rejoice in the Lord. That's, that's key for this. The continual habitual joy should mark us. And it's the knowledge of him that really is what leads our joy. What do we have to rejoice about, about God? Well, let me, let me think. Rejoice in who he is, that he is sovereign over everything. You can't steal my joy because I know that God is in control. And so no matter what happens, no matter what life throws at me, I can continue to be joyful because God is sovereign and he has a purpose. It filtered through his hand so I can trust him and I will not lose my joy because of something that happens. Nothing happens outside of his control. Furthermore, not only does he control it all, it says, God's word says, get this, that he controls it for my good. Whew, man. He controls it for my good. Think about those things as you're going through hardship. How can you take away our joy if we understand he's in control and his control is for my good? God is loving. God is wise. He has infinite understanding of every change of circumstance, every aspect of life. It's a whole different approach to understand that. And it's one thing to to hear it. It's one thing to read it. And it's another thing to actually live out of that, right? Like we have to continue to, to remind ourselves. This is why Paul is even saying like, say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. You have to tell yourself that. You should be repeating that to yourself. I can rejoice in the fact that God saved me and made me his own child, and he promised to give me an inheritance in Jesus Christ. I'm his child. Listen, he's already preparing a place for me to be with him in the future. I can rest in that. I can, I can have so much joy in that. I can rejoice because God is using my life so that other people can hear the gospel and be saved. God is using my life so that other Christians can be encouraged to love God and to serve him more faithfully. This is true of all of us, right? You have this opportunity. We can rejoice in this, that he has invited us in to be a part of his family business. That's pretty awesome. That's something that we should be joyful about. Here's something else I'm joyful about. Death is gain. That's pretty amazing. Jesus has defeated sin, Satan, hell, and death. And death to us. Listen, this earth is the closest we will get to hell. We we have eternity in store for us. Man, we should be the most joyful people that anybody comes in contact with. It's really untouchable if we think about it. Circumstances and all of that because it's buried deep in my confidence of who God is and his eternal promises to me. So in order to stand firm, be agreeable, be joyful, and then this, be reasonable. So he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Do you see that there? Let your reasonableness be known. What does he mean by reasonableness? Well, I'll just be honest, this is a really hard word to translate. And if you have, uh, I'm using the ESV, if you have a different translation, you probably have a different word in there. Um, So in the NIV, it says gentleness. In the NASB, it says a gentle spirit. In King James, it says moderation. In New Living, it says considerate. See, the idea behind the Greek word here is the opposite of being contentious or self-seeking. It's this idea of graciousness. I think gentleness is probably like this gracious gentleness is about the closest thing that English can use to describe this word. We can easily celebrate people who are argumentative 
and opinionated as if somehow they are stalwarts of the church. If, if, somehow, if somehow they're examples of standing firm. But Paul says something different. He says actually gentleness and graciousness, that's reasonableness. Be reasonable. In today's culture, churches seem to ignore that gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. They seem to ignore that this is a character requirement for leading a church. This week, Ray Ortland, who God has used massively to minister to me in the last year and a half of my life, he posted uh, this commentary on Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, which says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason, reason, frankly, with your neighbor, Lest you incur sin because of him, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 19, 17, 18. Ray says this, Leviticus 19 shines brightly in our dark world today. It opens up to us all a path forward where everyone can be safe from being punished for their honest beliefs safe from the rage of the mob, safe to be themselves among other gently authentic selves. This majestic old verse honors reasonable discourse, especially in disagreement. And this verse forbids the hatred that hastily shoves reason aside for the sake of a cheap victory. It says, let's all admit it, deep inside us is a lust that relishes shaming, belittling, winning, it feels virtuous, but it is evil. That smug little brat inside sure isn't Jesus. He reasons frankly with us, so now we know. We know how to disagree with each other. We calm down. We listen. We learn. We reply reasonably, trusting God to make it all work out. We refuse to cut corners or use force. We limit ourselves to what reason can accomplish. And if we aren't convincing to others, we accept it without faulting them. If we will humbly follow Jesus like this, we will still have a future together under the blessing of God. But if we recklessly turn from his path, we lose the beauty that could be ours and maybe lose everything. Someone has to start. I hope I have the grace to do so. The first step, to be willing to lose the argument. If I'm not willing to lose, then I've already lost and let you down. You know, what a great example of what Paul is talking about here in being reasonable. Let your reasonableness, did you catch this, be known to everyone. There's a lot of things that, that we're called to not let known, right? Like our generosity. There's, there's things that don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. There's, there's this call sometimes to not have it be public, but this is something that God is saying, listen, this should be public knowledge. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. So let me ask you, are you known for your graciousness? Are you known for your gentleness? Or are you known to be argumentative? quick-tempered, and harsh. To stand firm in the Lord, we must agree in the Lord. We, we need to rejoice in the Lord always and be reasonable. And then the fourth thing is be prayerful. Be prayerful. He goes on then and says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is following Jesus' words. If you remember on the Sermon on the Mount where he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, about what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Right? Not to be anxious, not to worry and it's difficult for most of us, you know, when we hear this command to not be anxious about anything, we, you know, like, okay, I hear that, but how do we do it? Well, Paul answers. Paul actually gives the remedy for anxiety. The remedy for anxiety is prayer. It's easy to say it, but do we believe it? Do we do it? 
spending three minutes in prayer is probably not going to cut it, although that's better than nothing. Actually, we probably won't say what we sometimes think, that, man, I just don't know if God hears, I don't know if prayer is working. Am I the only one that sometimes has those thoughts and those doubts? See, the reality is, prayer, as we go to God about these things, you know, instead of going to other people, kind of follow suit with reason, we're not, we're not going to people and look, no, we're actually going to God about these things. Let your requests be known to him. I love that it starts out with God is at hand. He's near. He, he's with us right now. Does he hear? Yeah, he does because he is present. He is at hand. D.A. Carson writes this, I have yet to meet a chronic worrier who enjoys an excellent prayer life. When we choose to pray instead of worry, there is a wonderful result that Paul talks about. He says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you're anxious about something, Paul's like, okay, pray, pray. Go to the Lord. Pray about it until you have the peace of God in your heart and mind. So stand firm in the Lord. In order to do so, we must be agreeable, joyful, reasonable, and prayerful. But he's not done. He keeps going. Number five is be positive. Verse eight, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Be positive is what Paul says. I think many of us know this verse. And again, it's kind of hard to put into practice, right? To always try to fill your mind with positive things. We need to keep in mind that God not only knows what I do or what I say, he also knows my thoughts. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And that includes, listen, that includes what we're thinking. And we often say, you know, could you imagine if everything that, was, that you ever thought was actually put up on the screen for everybody to see? Yikes. Um, but that's true of God. He knows. He sees. <coughs> Excuse me. So I remember learning in computer science this, this term, Geigo. I do have water. I saw you looking. Geigo. Anybody ever heard of Geigo? Huh? Oh, no, no, no not Geico. Not like the... <laughs> oh, goodness. Next will be Aflac or something like that. All right, so, no, no. It's okay. Geigo, G-I-G-O. You got it. Hey, tech guy. Yep. Geigo means garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. This is true of our thought life. It's true for our minds. If we put garbage into our heads, then we can expect garbage to come out. However, if we think wholly positive thoughts then we can expect positivity to come out. And that's Paul's point here. If you struggle with negative thoughts, remember, don't just listen to yourself. You have to talk to yourself. Like, just because you thought it doesn't mean it's true. Just because you think something doesn't automatically mean that it's true. You are actually the person who lies to yourself more than anyone else. You lie to yourself more than anyone else lies to you. You have to capture your thoughts, and you need to talk to yourself. Don't just listen to yourself. Paul goes on to say in verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Right? Paul is, is saying, like, practically, listen, if you struggle with negative thoughts, if you are constantly kind of critical and down on yourself or down on others, uh, then find people who are positive people. Look for people to imitate. Maybe somebody who's further along than you. Find godly Christians to imitate from whom to learn. And as you practice these things, the God of peace will be with you. You know, 
Uh, earlier, we received the peace of God as a result of prayer, but now we're also seeing that we receive the peace of God as we are positive people who think positively. Standing firm, being stable, does not depend on your circumstances. It's directly related to your thinking. Primarily, it's not how you think about yourself either. It's how you think about God. That will affect your ability to stand firm. Number six is be content. Be content. Paul goes on to say, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation to be content. Maybe you're thinking, wait a second, I thought last Sunday was about not being content, right? This whole idea of like straining forward, like, you know, effort, putting forward, you know, this pressing on. And now Paul's saying be content. Well, context is everything, right? We see in verse 12, he goes on to say this, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance, and need. Paul's not talking about his relationship with the Lord. Paul's talking about his physical needs. Whether he has a lot or whether he has a little, he's content on earthly things. Paul was not content when it came to his relationship with the Lord. He wanted to continue to strain forward, but when it came to things of the earth... He learned, you know what, I'm going to be content. Isn't it usually opposite in our lives? That that we are straining and trying to acquire more here on earth, but then are just super content and apathetic with our relationship with the Lord. And Paul is urging us, no, 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 don't fall into that trap. Be content with your earthly things, no matter what whether you have a lot or if you have a little. Instead, put your effort in your relationship with the Lord. These verses are about having faith in the God who provides, the God who is sovereignly in control over every circumstance in life, a God who sees and knows your needs, and he has promised to meet them in Christ. However, Paul's contentment, notice, it doesn't just happen. It's not just like, you know, this character quality. It's not just, you know, his personality. No, he had to learn to be content. He says this, I can do, oh, I've learned the secret, this is verse 12, of facing plenty. See, I've learned it. I've learned this secret of facing plenty. And then he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Probably one of the most misinterpreted verses in all of Scripture. Right? We, we put it on coffee mugs. We think about, you know, I had a good friend who once gave this description. I was like, that is so good. He's like, you know, you hear about the baseball player who steps up to the plate, and uh, it's the ninth inning. They're down by three runs. Bases are loaded. And you know what he's thinking? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can even hit a grand slam right here and win the game for us. He said, that's, that's fine and dandy, but what if the pitcher is on the mound and he's like, one more out. I can strike this guy out. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's so true. That's so good. See, it's not talking about that. It's talking about contentment. It's talking about whether you have much or you have little. I can do everything that God has for me to do in whatever I have. Whether I have little or I have much, God will do what he wants to do in little or much that I have. John Piper is well known for this statement, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That is really a statement about contentment. True contentment is found only in God, so let us find our satisfaction in him, and we will discover true and lasting contentment. 
And then finally, we did it. The seventh is be generous. Be generous. Paul writes in verses 14 through 20, he says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. All these other churches that I helped plant, they weren't giving to the mission, my missionary journey. But you, Philippians, you were generous. You gave. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That's a really powerful statement. What Paul is saying is, even, even more than being thankful about what you've given to me, I am more excited about what God is going to bless you with because you were faithful and obedient in giving to me. This is, I think, one of those principles that we shy away from because we have had prosperity preachers and swindlers who for their own gain have twisted this. But it's a reality that if you give, you will receive tenfold you will receive so much more if you are giving towards the mission of God, being obedient to what God is calling you to give. The reality is, and you hear it often, you can't outgive God, and that is a true statement. Now, where, where we shy away from this and where we get it wrong is that we think, oh, if I give $100, then God is going to give me 1000 That's not true. Sometimes it's not material blessing. Most times it's not, I would say. And there is this reality of us storing up treasure in heaven as well. It might not even be on this earth that we receive that blessing of being able to give. Talk to Al Longenecker afterwards. He'll, he'll tell you all about this right now. But this is a true concept. Paul, Paul, this is what Paul is saying. He's like, man, I'm so thankful. Listen, I'm so thankful for what you've given me, but I am way more excited about how God is going to bless you and your faithfulness to give. That's what he's saying. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. What he's able to do, the, the kingdom impact that he's able to do, to do because of their giving, man, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. See, this frees us up to be the most generous people. If we really believe that. Do you hear that promise? God will provide all of your needs. If we believe that, we'll be generous people. Not just with our finances, with our time, with our talent. Like that is a, a sweet promise. I heard a story, James Boyce actually shared this, this story, um, about this, this, this old French lady. That when she was a kid, she uh, was encouraged to, to write down all these promises of God on just a little piece of paper, and then she rolled them up. It was basically a, a paper the size of a, a stick of gum. And he, she would write the promise of God on that, roll it up, make a little scroll, and then she would stick it in this little box. And she had about 50 of them in this little box. This is when she's a child. And you know, every once in a while, just to go over and open up one of those promises and remind yourself and stick it back in. It was a promise box. Well, years later, during World War II, living in France, the destruction, the devastation that that brought to France, she was in a thick depression. And all of a sudden, she remembered this box. She knew exactly where she had it in her drawer. She pulled it out, and as she was walking over to, to, to some light by the window, she tripped over the rug, and they spilled out everywhere. And immediately, she said that she knew what God was telling her. She was praying, like, God, I just need one, I just need a promise. And all of a sudden, 
all of these 40 or 50 promises go spilling out. And she's like, I get it, God. I have so much to be thankful for. But I would just tell you that I think that this might be the sweetest of all the promises. That he would say, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let that sink in. That's an amazing promise. Be generous. God is generous with us. This frees us up from worry. It also frees us up to be generous. In a battle to stand firm, it's really a defensive action, isn't it? Think about soldiers who who take ground and then they're going to stand firm. They're going to defend the ground that they just took. It doesn't just happen. Soldiers have to be well-trained and they have to work well together in order to hold the ground they have won. The Christian life is also a battle. We battle against the world, the flesh, and Satan. The battle's hard, right? I don't have to tell you that. You know that. It's hard. It's difficult. But we don't just stand firm by attending worship services a few times a month. month. We don't stand firm by reading the Bible every once in a while or by praying every once in a while. No, we stand firm through these things, through hard work and discipline. And so let me encourage you to be disciplined and work hard at standing firm in the Lord yourself. And to do that, we must be agreeable. We need to be united around the gospel. You must be joyful, rejoicing in the Lord, not your circumstances. We must be reasonable, letting our gentleness and graciousness known to all in our community. We must be prayerful. The Lord is at hand. He is with us and he hears us. We must be positive and think godly thoughts. We must be content with our earthly possessions. And we must be generous because we can't outgive God. Let's pray. Father, you are so good and you are so gracious to us. Father, I pray for us as a church, that we would stand firm together by doing all of these things, by, by going to you and asking you to grow us and, and make sure that we are, Lord, being agreeable. Father, I pray that if there is any disagreements, if there is any maybe um, uh, place where there may be some bitterness, Father, I pray that you would deal with that. I pray that you would give us courage to be able to, in love, go and seek one another out. Help us to strive for unity. It's of utmost importance. Father, I pray that we would also be joyful. That truly, as we lift up our voices, Father, that that we would be a people who understand who you are, that we would be joyful in you. Father, help us to be reasonable, full of gentleness, that we would have a, a graciousness about us that would go beyond what we could even take credit for but it would be an example of the work you've done in our lives. Father, help us to be prayerful. Father, that we would continue to to seek you, not be anxious about things, but we can go to you. You are present. You are here. Father, help us to live life as an example to you, that we would be full of peace. Father, help us to, to be content. Help us to... Um, Father, be a people who are generous. God, all for your glory and for the fame of your name. In Jesus' name we pray.